Good morning, readers. Today, I'll be reading Tricking the Tally Man, which is about the 1790 consensus, the census, and to give some knowledge, some background knowledge. Um, when America was this new country and had a new government, there was no way to count everybody living in the country. So they would send Tally Man, like our friend here, to go to everyone's house in each different town or district to count how many people were living together and everyone had to be counted for. So this is called Trick in a Tally Man by Jacqueline Davis, illustrated by S.D. Schneider. And I find an interesting fact about our author right here. She's from Cleveland, Ohio. And for all my sports fan in the fans in the class, can anyone tell me what famous basketball team is from Cleveland, Ohio? If you don't know, I'll give you a hint. LeBron James played for them. How many people live in your house? How many people live on your street? Could you count them all? What if, they, what if you had to count everyone in your whole town or city? Could you do that? How? There was a time when the United States was a brand new country with a brand new government. In order to make laws that were strong and fair, the government needed to know how many people were living in each part of the country. So in 1790, it sent out 650 marshals to tally, that means count, people, all the people. Without computers, cars, and calculators, these men set out on a horseback to count every single person living in the United States. How did they do? How did they do it? Well, see that fellow over here, over there, the one who's droop, drooping in his saddle? Take a closer look, dear reader, because he is a tally man, brave and determined to get his count, a rather tricky task, as you're about to discover. So based on the title of the book, Tricking a Talent Man. What do you think the town that this brave, determined talent man is in or trying to do? When Phineas Bump rode into the town of Turnbridge, he was heart sick, saddle sore, and down to, on his luck. Heart sick because he hasn't seen his beloved wife, Jenny, in three months. Saddle sore because he's been riding through the Rudy Vermont woods. Down on his luck because his saddle bag was completely empty. How can I count the people without paper, ink, and quills, he asked Blue, his horse Blue. Blue being his horse didn't answer. She just stopped at the first house on the edge of the storm. Phineas dismounted, mumbling, I know, I know. Count them I must, and count them I will. He approached the door. Knock, knock. A woman opened the door, but just a crack. Madam, he proclaimed, I am Phineas Bump, Assistant Marshal of the United States of America. By order of our Congress and Constitution, I am here to tally the people of the District of Vermont. Be gone, tally man, said the woman, for we are a town that won't be counted. Bang! Went the door in Phineas's face. Oh, he said softly, tis another one looking for a fight. Phineas liked the challenge. He stiffened his spine and raised his hand to the door. Knock, knock, knock. Readers, why do you think the woman closed her door? Can you make a prediction? The woman opened the door again, but only half a crack. Count on you, I must, and count on you, I will, said Phineas. But for tonight, I seek only a roof over my head. Might there be an inn nearby? We have neither inn or nor tavern for a town that doesn't welcome strangers. Bang, goes the door again. Phineas' smile widened. Oh, hey, a challenge indeed. Perhaps I could sleep in the corner of your shed, he shouted. But this time the door didn't open at all, not one inch. Phineas just laughed as he grabbed Blue's bridle and walked to a nearby stand of white pines. Should we give up and go home, old Blue? He asked as he unsaddled his horse. Blue tossed her head. That's what I thought too. 
said Phineas, and he unrolled his blanket and laid down to sleep on the cold, hard ground. Meanwhile, on the other side of the door, Mrs. Pepper called out, children, come quick. The terrible tally man has come to Turnbridge. What's a tally man? Asked Mercy. Ooh, he's an awful scoundrel sent by the government, said Mrs. Pepper. He counts every person in a town. And the more people he counts, the more money our town we have to pay. That's called taxes, said Boston. Mrs. Pepper nodded, Hey, and if there is another war, the government will know how many men we have and will steal them away to be soldiers. That's called conscrip conscription, said Boston. Hey, it is my boy, devils and deuces, whatever shall we do? Patience burst into tears. Thomas had Thomas hid in the wood box, but Boston said, don't worry, Ma, I've got a plan. Oh, <laughs> hey, we will be the town that tricks the tally man. Now, readers, do we think they will be successful at tricking the tally man? We shall see. In the morning, Phineas rose and brushed the pine needles off his hair. Count them, I must, and, well, you know, he said to Blue before walking to the pepper house. Knock, knock. Mrs. Pepper opened the door grandly and offered Phineas the best seat by the fire. He pulled out an empty ink pot, a broken quill, and a letter. Tis from my wife, he explained. But as I haven't planned any other paper, I will use this to make my record. Mrs. Pepper stared sharply at the date on the letter. Two months old. Has it been that long since you've seen her? That long and longer, sighed Phineas. Phineas scooped some ashes from the fire into the ink pot mixed them with his spittle and dipped on the broken quill into the bottle. Then in the margin of the letter, Phineas carefully wrote Turnbridge, October 18th, 1790. He turned to Mrs. Pepper. Madam, your name? Sarah Pepper. Your husband is, alas, gone. She said, clasping her hands and looking heavenward. My condolences, widow Pepper. And how many children have you? Not a one. Phineas looked up. I count three mattresses, a jack bed with a trottle, and a cradle. Now, readers, do you think Mrs. Pepper is going to get caught by the tally man? Oh, but they are not for children, Mrs. Pepper explained. Phineas sighed. I will mark but one, he said. One free white female. Thus counted. She replaced her kids with the animals. So there's a chicken, little chicks, cat, and a cow. Oh, and there's a pig right here too. As Phineas, mar as Phineas marched outside and approached the door to the next house, Mrs. Pepper scurried close by. The house is empty, Mrs. Bump, Mr. Bump, she called out. Phineas knocked on door after door, but every house was empty. Not a single person in the town of Turnbridge could be found. Widow Pepper, are you telling me that in all of the Turnbridge, there is not but one free white female, he asked? Twould appear so, said Mrs. Pepper with a twinkle in her eye. Then I shall post the results so that anyone who disputes the facts may come forth. And if none disputes them by tomorrow, they shall be declared fair and true, and so shall they stand. Phineas nailed the results of the tally to the chestnut tree that stood in the town square. Blue, he said, today I have been played for a fool, but tomorrow we shall see who has the last laugh. <laughs> At that very moment, Boston Pepper came running in. Ma, ma, he shouted. I've been, I've been to the next town over and it's not for taxes or soldiers. He's counting the people. It's to figure out how many men we send to the new government. What do you mean, said Mrs. Pepper. The more people he counts, the more men we'll send to the new government in Philadelphia. The more men we send, the more votes we get. 
And that's how we'll get the things we need, like good roads and regular mail delivery. Cap and cold, exclaimed Mrs. Pepper. We must trick the tallyman into counting up us again. But how? Don't worry, Ma said Boston. I've got a plan. That night, Phineas lay down to sleep among the tall white pines, still thinking of his Jenny and missing her more than ever. The next morning he rose, citizen of Tunbridge, he called out, are the results as posted fair and true? Mm, not entirely, said Mrs. Pepper. I think, sir, that you must count again. Phineas shook his head. Madam, he said, that I cannot do. I am entirely out of paper. Mrs. Pepper frowned. Paper was rare indeed. The talent man turned to leave. Wait, I will gather your paper, Mrs. Pepper declared. By tomorrow, you will have a ledge full. Then she said, added with a whisper, a thin ledge full. Phineas shook his head again. But madam, he said, I have neither quills nor ink. Mrs. Pepper pursued her lips. We will boil you six pots of ink and gather a dozen quills. But madam, said Phineas, I could not possibly sleep another night at the White Pine. And he turned away to leave. That's a little joke because he didn't sleep at a White Pine and he slept on the floor. Tee. Mrs. Pepper squinted. Constant devotion runs in ordin an ordinary. You may stay there free of charge. Oh, but madam, said Phineas with a twinkle in his eyes, I'm afraid I'm not fit to be seen in such a fine place. My cloak, you see. Mrs. Pepper held her hand out. Give it to me, Tally man. I will mend it myself. So as we can see, Miss, Mrs. Pepper is trying to sweet talk or trying to convince, persuade, per se, Phineas, the tally man, to recount the vote after she found out what it really means. Phineas breakfast that day on frumenty tea and mutton chops, dined on breakfast and baked beans, and supped on bread and butter and beer. He slept in a feathered bed, and in the morning, his cloak was better than new. Now, readers, based on the pictures, can anyone tell me what frumenty and mutton chops are? He feasts on frumenty, frumenty, and mutton chops. Now, if you said frumenty was powder, I mean chop, porridge, you will be correct. Porridge is like the the vocabulary they used like back in the days, 1790s, before we used to call it porridge. We call it frumenty. And mutton chops are lamb chops, which he is happily eating right here. Now, how do we think Mr. Bump felt after getting a good night rest, eating well, and his cloak, his cloak was brand new. Well, not brand new, but it looked very new. It wasn't dirty anymore from sleeping on the floor. On the steps of the ordinary, Phineas found a wood-backed leather-bound ledger with 20 sheets of paper sewn into it, six pots of the blackest ink, and a dozen turkey clothes. Well-rested, well-fed, and well-supplied, Phineas knocked on Mrs. Pepper's door. Madam, he said, I have come to count your family. Of course. Of course, of course, Mr. Bump, do come in. Please meet my er recently returned husband, Mr. Samuel Samuel Pepper. But I thought Samuel Pepper was in heaven. Hmm. And with him, said Mrs. Pepper, with a wave of her arm, my 15 children. 17 souls under one roof, said Phineas. At the Swindle House, Phineas counted a husband, a wife, a brother, his wife, a father, and 22 children. Can you imagine his household that big? 
at the Gripe House, he counted a husband, a wife, two cousins, and 13 children. And at the Thick Penny House, he counted a husband, a wife, two sisters, their husbands, four sets of grandparents, and 37 children. That is a huge household. Wow. 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 I am, I am baffled, flabbergasted. By sunset, Phineas had counted 1,726 people. He nailed the results to the chestnut tree. Citizens and animals of Turnbridge, he announced, I have posted the results of my tally. If none disputes them by tomorrow, they shall be declared fair and true, and so shall they stand. Then he walked through the evening gloom to his room at the ordinary grumbling. This a tally not worth the paper it is written on. Just then, Boston came bursting through the door of the Pepper House. Ma, he called. I've been talking to a stranger who's passing through, and he says the continuing is, is for taxes and soldier. Heaven help us. And for sending men to represent us in the new government. Both, asked Mrs. Pepper. Both, answered Boston. Cheese and chowder, said Mrs. Pepper. She pressed her hands to her temples. If the Taliban's count is high, we will owe too much taxes and soldiers. If the Taliban's count is low, we will have a weak voice in the new government. Who thought of this method? The man who wrote the constitution, answered Boston. Clever devils they be, shouted Mrs. Pepper. Oh, Boston, what is your plan now? Boston paced the floor and tapped his forehead. He pulled his hair, he rubbed his nose. He picked up the fire poker and waved at it. Mother, he finally said, I'm working on it. The next morning, Phineas slept late. The cows were milked and gazing on the common by the time he had packed up and saddled up Bloom. As Phineas and Blue approached the chestnut tree, he called out, citizen of Turnbridge, are the results as posted fair and true? Not entirely, said Mrs. Pepper. I think, sir, that you must count again. Now, readers, how do you think Mr. Bump felt that he has to recount that town for the third time and he's been heart sick and he's been heart sick since he haven't not seen his wife in three months madam pepper shouted phineas i have been away from my dearest wife for three months i will not stay in turnbridge even one more day boston pushed his way through the crowd sir if you will but count us one more time. I shall deliver to you a letter from your wife. Impossible, declared Phineas. I promise it, declared Boston. Phineas said at Boston. Then I will count, he said, one more time. And so Phineas walked house to house. By evening, he had counted 487 people. He nailed the results to the old chestnut tree and called out, citizen of Turnbridge, I ask you now, are the results as posted fair and true? Boston Pepper stepped forward, fair and true, they are good, sir. Then he pulled a letter from behind his back and handed it to Phineas. The postal writer came through earlier this town. He's been asking for a, for a Mr. Phineas bump through half the town in Vermont. Phineas broke the seal of the letter and read Jenny's word. Only Boston was near enough to see the tears of joy that sparkles in the talisman's eye. Phineas folded the letter and coughed once. My dear Jenny is well, he stifled, and she sends news. News. We are to have a child in the spring. Boston turned to the shuttered houses and yelled, his dear Jenny is well, and they will have a child come spring. A loud huzzah rose up from the town and the people spilled out in the square. You know, Mr. Bump, said Boston, I would have given you the letter even if you have not counted, even if you did not want to count the vote. You know, and I, young man, would have counted you even without this letter. Then he raised his hand solemnly and said, 
for count you I must and count you I did. And now my job is well and barely done entirely. And so Phineas Bump rode out of town to up Turnbridge, no longer heart sick, sad or sore or down on his luck. Many more weeks of counting lay up headed of him, but now he traveled with a far lighter heart. Mrs. Pepper in Boston watched as Phineas rode into the Vermont woods. Ah, Boston said Pepper, I guess we are not the town that tricked the talent man. After all, sure we are, Ma, said Boston. We're the town that tricked the talent man twice. But then he winked at his mother. We decided twas better to be fair and true. And so we were entirely the end. Now, I loved that story. What can you take away from the story? What did you learn? Can you add anything you heard from the story to add to your knowledge?